hello to some to some friends. It's great to have some friends from Denver uh, joining us today, and some some family scattered throughout um, my daughter and son. But uh, you know, last night had a chance to, as is our custom, whenever we have friends that come out to visit with us, we go to Calhoun's. That's just that's where we should go. So um, some good friends, Dave and Sherry Engelkin, that uh, actually hadn't seen for probably a decade. Um, they look the same. Not so sure about myself, um, but they look the same. We went out to Calhoun's with uh, Bart and Kim, had a great time hanging out, eating some good uh, fish and chips, which has become my custom. And uh, then we came back to the house out on the deck and just had a great time. Just four hours of hanging out together. And, you know, it's relationships that make life a lot of fun and just bring so much enjoyment. And to get together with friends like that means so much. Um, but you know, on the other side of the coin, not only do friendships make life fun, but they help get us through some pretty challenging times. And this Friday, uh, my wife and I drove up to Indianapolis and we went to my mother's husband's father or mother's funeral. And, you know, she had lived 92 years, but it doesn't matter when you lose someone close to you, it's tough. And uh, it's those relationships and friendships that help get us through and help us to, you know, survive some pretty, pretty tough times. And I was inspired by her, her faith and, and how she lived her life. But, you know, anytime that I go to a funeral, and I don't know about you guys, but it, it just causes me to think. This makes me step back and ask myself about my life and how I'm spending it because it's not guaranteed. And I thought about what Paul said in Acts 20. This is why I think up often at times like that. Paul said, and you don't need to turn there. By the way, we're going to spend our time in, in 1 Samuel 23. So you can turn there. But Paul said in Acts chapter 20, he said, I consider my life worth nothing if only... I can finish the race and complete the task that the Lord has given to me. And you know, when I, we think about our lives, isn't that really what it's about? Is that in the end, we can know that we have finished the race and that we have completed the task that God has given us. And yet in that opportunity, as we spend our lives Paul also reminds us in Acts 14, he says that we're going to go through a lot of hardships to enter the kingdom. And in order to enter the kingdom through those hardships, it takes great spiritual friendships to help us through. We need relationships to help us to, so to speak, hit that mark, to finish the race. And to complete the task and to endure those hardships. We need great spiritual friendships. You know, you think back, uh, Paul had Barnabas. Paul had Timothy. At later times, he had Titus. Moses had Aaron. Elijah had Elisha. Naomi had Ruth and on and on. Spiritual relationships are vital. And so, what I want to talk about this morning and remind us of is that it's the power of godly relationships that get us through. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 15 and verse 16. While David was at Horish in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. David needed Jonathan to get through. And Jonathan came and helped David find his strength in God. I want to talk briefly this morning about four things. One, godly relationships. They are for everyone. When I talk about God, godly relationships, I'm talking about one another relationships, iron sharpens iron relationships, discipling relationships, whatever you call it. But it's the, the bond between brothers or the bond between sisters and brothers and sisters. 
we all need these relationships. One another relationships, discipling relationships, iron sharpens iron relationships are for everyone. David was a man after God's own heart. There's really, it's hard to search the whole scriptures and find anyone more inspiring than David. And yet David absolutely needed Jonathan. Everyone needs these kinds of relationships, whether we're physically old, whatever, and, and that old, by the way, that old marker has continued to move, you know, farther from me. I don't know. Old is, is a lot farther than it used to be. So whether you're old physically or young physically, if you're in your teens or in your 80s, or if you're young spiritually, maybe just a few months or a few years, or you've been a, a Christian, a follower of Christ for decades, one another relationships are for everyone. Whether you consider yourself mature in Christ or not, Godly relationships are for everyone. And David and Jonathan showed us that by example. Again, you look throughout the scriptures, you'll, you'll see that again and again, that Moses needed Aaron. You know, there was a time with, with Paul, he, he wrote his letter. He's like, Timothy, get to me quickly. In fact, if you could please get here before winter, that would be great. Then later he writes to Titus and says the same exact thing. Could you get here? Come be with me. Get here before winter. I need to see you. We need these kinds of relationships. And it's, it's not one over another relationships. It's one to another. There are different dynamics in our spiritual relationships. There are certainly times for, you know, to, so to speak, sit at the feet of someone older, wiser, and get help. But then there's times in that very same relationship where it'll be the other way around. We'll learn from those that are younger, so to speak. So dynamics and relationships change, but the fact that we absolutely need and that these relationships are for everyone never changes. And it was David's son, Solomon, who later wrote that in Ecclesiastes 4, he says, pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them back up. He said, that is a shame, that anyone would fall and there's no one to help him or her up. Guys, if you fall, who, who's there to pick you up? Is there someone that absolutely knows when you fall, when you struggle, when you hurt? We need that so that we can find that help. But I look at David and Jonathan and I look and I ask myself this question, what was it about David or what was it about Jonathan? Why did they, why did they build this friendship, this deep bond? What catalyzed that? And if you look in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, I think we get a little bit of a, of a view. What catalyzed David and Jonathan's relationship. Look in verse 57 of chapter 17. Of course, David had just killed Goliath, right? And that, that's a whole nother message to be inspired by. But in verse 57, as soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I'm the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. After David had finished speaking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. David kills Goliath. He literally he cuts off Goliath's head after the this, this sling to the forehead, slingshot to the forehead, takes it. He comes into probably the palace of Saul and he's holding, which is kind of gross for, for me to think about, but he's holding the head of Goliath as he's speaking to Saul. And I can only imagine that Jonathan, being the prince of Israel, Saul's son, is standing there 
or he's there, he's watching, he's listening. And so David comes in and it says, the Bible says, after he finished speaking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David. Why? Because of who David was. What Jonathan saw in David was courage, was a man of action. He was a man who was passionate about honoring God, so much so that when the whole Israelite army was quaking in fear, he stepped forward. And Jonathan witnessed that. And he witnessed his faith and his audacity. And I think that's why Jonathan became one in spirit with David. He saw something in David. And if, if we're going to make it through, we need to align ourselves with brothers and sisters like that. That are, that are going to inspire us and call us higher and support us and inspire us. Men and women of faith that will step forward instead of shrinking back. And so Jonathan became one in spirit with David. David needed that relationship. And I think that what we see here in this is that really the great glue of, of relationships that make an impact is faith. Why did Jonathan become one in spirit? He saw those things in David. And for you and I, what's going to really glue relationships together is faith, faithfulness. And, you know, I think about even the world knows the value of these of mentoring relationships, of relationships where you gain courage or strength or instruction or teaching. You know, mentoring is, is in every business book out there, right? The value of mentoring and and listening and sitting at the feet. So if the world sees that value, how much more so should we go after and know I need these type of relationships and I need to align myself with men and women like David. Secondly, not only are these relationships for everyone, these relationships are intentional. It was in first in, in uh, 1 Samuel 23, where actually the uh, New American Standard Bible puts it this way. It says, Jonathan arose and went to David. Verse 16. Jonathan arose and went to David. You know, what was going on in David's life at the time, if you read all of chapter 23, is that he had just saved this city called Kaliah from the Philistines. In fact, David kept this city from undergoing a calamitous defeat. And then right after his conversation with Jonathan, there was uh, the, the people of the Ziphites. They were ready to turn David over to King Saul. So David is in the midst of betrayal on one hand and treachery on the other hand. And in the midst of that, Jonathan says, I'm going to go find David. I need to go and find David. So he got up and he went to David. He desperately, what if, what if Jonathan hadn't gotten up and said, I'm going to find David. And David was running from Saul. It probably wasn't the easiest thing to do. But what if he hadn't found David? What might have changed in, in David's trajectory? You know, think about what Paul says. He says, you know, when we think about relationships being intentional, Paul says, I don't fight like a man beating the air. I'm not like a shadow boxer. No, there's purpose behind my life. And I think that for us, and I know for me, sometimes I can forget that I'm really in a spiritual battle. David couldn't forget the battle that he was undergoing because it was life and death. And it was real. He knew he was in a spiritual battle, but sometimes perhaps we can grow a little numb to the fact that we're, we actually are in a spiritual battle. I know I can. 
And, you know, recently, and I don't know if it's just me or, you know, I'm getting a little older, but it makes me think more about my life. And, and I asked myself recently, I'm like, is, I want to make sure that the second half of my life, whatever God gives me, that it's at least, if not more powerful than the first half, more passionate, more devoted, more godly, more impactful. And if I'm not careful, it won't be. The glory days will be back there, like Bruce Springsteen talks about. It'll be in the past. But for me, I know that I have to battle against complacency spiritually. I have to battle against selfishness. I battle against cowardice. I battle against the worries of this life. I battle against the deceitfulness of wealth, comfort. But I can forget about that battle because it's not as maybe in your face as the battle that David faced. But we're in a battle. And I think that if we forget that we're in a spiritual battle, we won't need each other. We won't feel like we need each other as much as we do. And I think that's what bonded Jonathan and David together as well. These relationships, they must be intentional. In, in chapter 18, verse 3, after Jonathan had witnessed this conversation with David and his father Saul, verse 3 says, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as, as himself. He says, I am going to promise you right here and right now, David, I am covenanted to you. That's pretty intentional. He was determined that they would have this special relationship. Later in chapter 20, verse 16, he takes it kind of up, up a notch, if you will. It says that Jonathan made a covenant with the whole house of David. And then before that, I won't read it, but when David begins to run for his life, in chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Then David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked him, What have I done? What's my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Jonathan was intentional in his relationship with David. But David was intentional in his relationship with Jonathan as well. When he was in trouble and he was running for his life, first it says that he went to Samuel. It's good to have a few people in your life, right? David went to Samuel, got some instructions, some thought, and then he says, I'm going to find Jonathan. And he finds Jonathan and he just lays it out. He says, what is going on? I'm running for my life. What have I done? I'm at the end of my rope here. I need you. And that intentionality impacted the support that they gave to each other. And look how vulnerable David was. He was intentionally wide open with Jonathan. And you know, that's not always in vogue to be that vulnerable, that transparent, that honest, that weak especially sometimes for guys. But it's vital that we do that. You know, for me, um, having, we've just moved here January 1, so it's, you know, five months or so, six months coming on. And in my strongest, longest spiritual relationships, they're in Denver. Some still in Chicago, still keeping some of those relationships from a couple decades ago. But it's only natural that having moved to Lenore City, that it takes some time. And so I'm staying close to my brothers. They're still in Denver. But I recognize I better have them right here. And thankfully, there's some, some great brothers and, and just too many to name uh, of you guys and, and the sisters and couples that have really loved my wife and I. But, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I just, Bill and I had a cup of coffee and I said, can we take a walk? And, and I said, Bill, we read 
Bill Graham. We, we read this scripture together. And I said, will you watch my back spiritually? I need you. And let me, let me share with you the propensity of my heart. Here's where Satan attacks me most. Because I want to be at my best spiritually. And I know I can't do that on my own. And I can't just do it on relationships that I see once in a while back in Denver. Relationships need to be intentional. Now, that doesn't mean that they're planned and everything's like, you know, calendarized. There's, it's organic. It's natural. Uh, and honestly, okay, I won't, I won't say, Bill didn't like, um, you know, take a slingshot and kill Goliath, okay? But, but what I saw in Bill was a man I respected spiritually in a short amount of time. I was like, hmm, I'm going to align myself with a guy like that. Does that make sense? I respect him spiritually. I respect his faith. I respect his discipline, whatever. I, you know, Lisa, what a wonderful family. The kids. Uh, I would be an idiot to not align myself with a brother like that. And so we did. Will you get my back? Watch my back. Because only moms have eyes in the back of their heads. I don't. And so I need a brother standing behind me that can see what I can't see. Relationships need to be intentional. Thirdly, godly relationships find their strength from God. The best relationships point us to God. The best relationships encourage us to find strength in God, not in ourselves. Best, the best relationships don't just, you know, build our self-confidence. That's not it. Or even codependency on one another. Now, I need Bill, but the, the relationship there is going to point me to God for strength. And... There's a, there's a couple in, in Denver that um, my wife and I get with once in a while. And actually, Jim Hess uh, had an opportunity to share a message here a month or so ago. And every time my wife and I um, would get with them, we would get in the car and I'd be driving home thinking, hmm, I just want to be a better Christian. Every time we'd be have a hang out at dinner with them or we'd be at a, a Bible study or just whatever. We, so many times we would get in our car and look at each other and say, I want to be a better Christian. Because they just, they pointed us to God. Just being with them inspired us. So helpful. So I want to give my wife a, a chance, an opportunity here just to share briefly um, about some of those relationships and how they've impacted her. So. Hey, church. Um, I'm excited to be able to share. I don't know where to look. There you go. I do. Sorry, I'm not a Zoom pro. Um, okay. Anyway, Dan just wanted me to share a little bit about relationships that have impacted us. And I think just listening to him speak, also thinking of our move and being here, you know, there was a period of time where I feel like I really pulled back from relationships. And maybe some of you can relate. We've moved a lot. We've lived in big cities. We've um, been through a lot. We had a long history in the church. And I think for me, I, I got a little cold feet. I felt like my relationships had become more agenda driven. And whether or not that's true, I'm, I'm sure some of that was my own self-righteous heart. Some of it was actually true and legitimate. Um, but for whatever reason, I kind of pulled back and I didn't want to hurt anymore. I didn't want to put my heart out there. I didn't want to be vulnerable. And um, I knew something was missing. I, I would leave those relationships feeling like, okay, we confess sin. Okay, we want to take the world. We want to save the world. But I didn't feel connected. And through time, you know, and God working in my heart, Dan and I had times where we just prayed and we felt lonely. We felt like we wanted more. And therefore, we put it out in prayer. And then came a time in our life that we really, you know, as happens, as you get older, you go through tough things. And like Dan alluded to, it's the worries of this life that threaten to choke out the word. 
And, you know, I, I think that we really saw that as we got older and you deal with, you know, uh, children and adult children and them trying to find their faith and you deal with career disappointments and financial challenges, marriage issues, you realize how true that is. And we just got to a point where we said we need to physically move to be in a position to be have closer relationships. So we did. We we moved to a different part of the Denver church uh, where there was a couple there, Greg and Teresa Jackson. Uh, Jim and Marlene had not moved there yet. We knew we needed more. Um, and we, we did that. We began to get with them. And I can't even begin to tell you how healing it was for me. Um, I can still hear Greg Jackson saying in my head, saying, that's fair. That's fair. And he would do it so often because we would get together and just talk about the hurts that we've been through in life and ministry and church. And the validation that we received from them was incredible. And then God, you know, as he does, he moved Jim and Marlene five minutes from us. What I really see in those relationships, as Dan shared, it's the one another. Um, there were, we, we had gone through so many parallel things things in life and so many opportunities for Satan to try to steal our faith, to dishearten us from God, from his church, from the path for our lives. And there was a lot of hurts and a lot of wounds. And through committing together, I truly, in the beginning, we couldn't get together and talk and not cry. And that's not all bad, but it was just overflowing because there was so much hurt. Um, struggling side by side with our kids, because as a mom, you know how there is a dad, you know that battle that you just want the world for them and you see them struggle and hurt and how difficult that is. You want that for your spouse. You want them to be in a career where they feel valued and appreciated. And that's just not always the case. So we would get together and talk and pray. And I'm so grateful that God allowed me through his grace to reopen my heart, to uh, allow myself to be vulnerable again, to allow myself to weep with other women that I respected um, and the healing that has come from that. And I've shared with them now, it doesn't matter what zip code I have. You guys are my sisters in the faith and will be for life. However, even as Dan shared, I look forward to those relationships here um, we can keep and we can talk and we can Zoom and we can visit one another, but we also need that here. And it's just a time to open our lives and to do life together. And that is what I most look forward to giving and receiving from you here. And I just pray to encourage each of you to have those relationships because the blessings are indescribable. Thank you. Well, appreciate uh, my wife sharing about those relationships and and those relationships really and others, but those really helped us find strength in God. And that's what we needed. And that's what we all need as we as we face hardships in life. We need those relationships that will help us find strength in God. And I hope that we're investing in those as well. Lastly, I want us to think about this last point that godly relationships focus on God's promises. Godly relationships focus on God's promises, which is really just God's spoken word, right? Anything that God said in his word, he may not say, I promise, but if he says it, it's a promise, right? The godly relationships focus on God's promises. And that's exactly what Jonathan did with David. When it says in, in chapter 23, uh, 16, he, he helped him find strength in God. Here's what he said. He said, David, don't be afraid. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel. And I'll be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. Now, how did Jonathan know that? Probably because David and Jonathan had this deep relationship that was actually over a number of years. We know that probably Saul was running from, I mean, excuse me, David was running from Saul for about seven to 10 years. And David, in their relationship, he, I'm sure a number of times, he, he told Jonathan, you know, I was out tending my father's sheep, and the servant said, hey, dad wants to see you. And Samuel, 
okay? And he shows up and Samuel anoints him as king over Israel and says that God has ordained that you be king. And so here's Jonathan years later saying, whoa, David, here's what God said. You even told me this, but this was God's promise. You will be king over Israel. I promise you. Godly relationships focus on God's word. You know, the scripture teaches us to speak the truth in love. That's keeping God's promises before one another, is to speak the truth in love. There's a book, uh, oh, it might be on my bookshelf right there. There's a book called Radical Candor that has gotten a lot of airplay, so to speak, in the business world. It's a great book. We use it at my, at my firm. We believe in the principles. Here's the two principles of this great book called Radical Candor. One, care personally. So one, care personally. Two, challenge directly. That's the whole book. You don't have to read it. That's the point of the book. To be radically candid is to care personally and challenge directly. I love it when the business world comes up with an idea that's absolutely fully the scriptures. Because is that not what we're taught? Speak the truth in love. There's another scripture. Actually, again, David's son Solomon said this, Proverbs 27, 6. You know this one. It says that an enemy multiplies kisses, but wounds from a friend can be trusted. An enemy multiplies kisses, but wounds from a friend can be trusted. Now, honestly, in, in my life as, as a Christian, 30-some years, I'm grateful that I probably only needed to be wounded by a friend a couple times. I think back and I can think of two times that I really felt wounded. And guess what? I needed it. It was a friend who was willing to say something that was difficult that I needed to hear. So I don't think, you know, wounds from a friend can be trusted. I don't think we need to go around, you know, always saying these hard and, you know, things like that. But there are times we will need that. And my question is, do you have someone that would be willing to graciously wound? David did. You know, I think about... Uh, uh, I really appreciate my boss at work. He uh, he really he teaches an, an, by example that silence is deadly. As the CEO of our company, he recognizes he's, he better have some people around him that will not be silent because he knows he doesn't have eyes in the back of his head. He can't see it all. He can't hear it all. What's going on in the firm? What people are thinking? And so his call is speak to me. In fact, he's looked me in the eye and said, Dan, you, one of your roles. You challenge me. If I get off of our core values, you better challenge me. You better call me to account. Guys, if, if this happens in the business world, that we recognize how important it is to speak the truth in love, how much more so for us? It's dangerous to be silent. Second, I'm going to close here. Second Corinthians 2, verse 11. Paul basically says that he is aware that Satan has schemes to outwit us. Satan has schemes. He's scheming. And his goal is to outwit us. Once again, I'm not that smart, and I'm not always that soft-hearted. So I need brothers and sisters in my life so that I don't get outsmarted by Satan because he's pretty sly. We don't need just buddies, but we need David and Jonathan type relationships. We need to know that one another relationships are for everyone. These relationships are intentional. These relationships help us find strength in God and keep us focused on God's word. 
David, after Jonathan's death, here's what he said about Jonathan. He said, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Let's build these godly relationships that will help us make it through. Thanks.